Welcome to the Work Camper Show, brought to you by WorkCamper.com. This podcast helps you discover how to finance your RV travel dreams. Each one of our episodes will introduce you to people who are already living the RV lifestyle or to work camping opportunities all around the U.S. You'll also learn how to hit the road the right way and make the most of every opportunity. Now let's turn over today's show to your host, Greg Gerber. This week I'll be speaking with a man who has lived a rather nomadic lifestyle since childhood. Today he chases construction jobs around the country, which supports his need for adventure and provides income to support his travels. Today's episode is sponsored by Work Camper News. With its diamond and platinum membership tools, Work Camper News is much more than just a job listing website. When you put the tools of this professional service into action, you'll find out just how easy it can be to turn your work camping dreams into reality. The one-year memberships open the door to a one-stop shop for all things work camping. Being the original resource for work camping, you'll find the largest number of job listings, be able to connect with the community of work campers, and view resources compiled by experts who've been enjoying the RV lifestyle for many years. If you're serious about leading a successful and enjoyable work camping lifestyle, then a Diamond or Platinum membership is for you. You can even get started with free 30-day trial by visiting workcamper.com forward slash trial. Embark on new adventures today with the support of Work Camper News behind you. Stephen Spears earned a living as an electrician for many years until he transitioned into being an author and speaker. His first book is about photo-Germanic alphabet used by indigenous northern Europeans. He instructs people how to use those images as a divination tool. He refurbished the school bus and has been living in it full-time since 2022 with his cat named Loki. Stephen will still do construction projects from time to time, but tries to avoid them because they tend to keep him confined in one area longer than he'd like to stay. So he looks for short-term opportunities, such as wiring a house under construction or one that's being remodeled. To tell us more about his nomadic experiences and the joys he gets from them, please welcome Stephen Spears to the show. Thanks for joining me today, Stephen. I appreciate your time. Tell me a little bit about yourself and what got you into the RVing and work camping lifestyle. I've always been nomadic by nature. Since I was a little kid, my mom always moved us around. For the bulk of my childhood, I never lived any one place for more than a year at a time. Usually it was maybe three, six, or nine months here and there, and we were always bouncing around. So ha- like ba- setting up roots, living in one place, being stationary or sedentary, however you want to look at it, that was always like alien to me. And even when I got it, before I was living this way, working as an electrician, I would chase the big jobs and I used that as a catalyst for moving around. But as I transitioned out of doing construction work, because I'm engaging a lot of personal research and the people I was working around, they didn't really want to hear about it at lunch and at break. And I heard several times, oh, you think so much, why don't you go write a book or something? So I did, and then that gave me an excuse to travel around making appearances, doing meet and greets and book signings and things like that. And so it was just a natural transition as far as the way of life that it it resonates with me. What's your book about? It's about the Elder Futhark, which is a Proto-Germanic alphabet that is both phonetic as well as esoteric in nature, meaning each symbol corresponds with the sound you make so it can be employed as a written or spoken language tool, in addition to having an esoteric or metaphysical value, so it can be employed as a divination tool, similar to tarot card readings or scrying, but very different. It's a part of the indigenous spiritual folk way of Northern Europeans and their descendants. Okay. Sounds like it would require a lot of research in order to write something like that. Yes. Yeah, a, a, a little bit research. And again, it's a part of a spiritual folk way. So a lot of what I talked about, I learned through the process of transcendental meditation. And you can't take an online course or buy a book for that. But like I said, it functions as an instruction guide for um, divination. Okay. You know, say you're like, okay, I want to use the runes to uh, most people think read the future, but that's a very inaccurate conceptualization, but I'll put a pin in that. Mm-hmm. But so somebody gets a set of runes and they do a pull and say so they pull Pertho or they pull Lagus or they pull Kinaz or any of these runes. And they're like, okay, what does that mean? So they flip to that section in my book and they read 
what that rune represents or conceptualizes. And then they figure out and they're like, okay, so how does that apply to what I'm focusing on or asking about or thinking about or looking for resolution on? Okay. I use the runes as like a check engine light on my car every morning. When I get in and I crank up my engine, I need to be aware of any problems. I, if I need to know where my gas level is. I need to know what my oil pressure is. I need to know what the RPMs are. I need to know if the temperature is spiking, if it's too high or too low or fluctuating at a dangerous level. Anything I need to be aware of, I need that indicator. And so that's how the runes function. It's like all of the forces that are represented by the whole food art are present in our lives, but different ones take primacy at different times. Okay. So it's like, what do I need to focus on today? What do I need to really be cognizant of or or be wary about is this going to be a day that's going to really trigger me a lot with the circumstances and so i need to be mindful to not allow myself to react the way i instinctively would just sure so it's a really fluid thing very good how long ago did you buy your rv you know i got my schoolie i'm actually living in a converted mid bus it's a 2000 chevy express 3500 just a one-ton chevy van with a school bus chassis on it. I got that back in 2020 and I've been in it full time since 2022. I was making short little runs. I was using Grand Forks, North Dakota as my hub. And that, that kind of became really limiting. And so I got the schoolie and I just, and then of course me and my girlfriend at the time, we had a pretty, pretty finalistic breakup. And that helped catalyze me getting out too. So me and my cat Loki, we just loaded up and headed out. We haven't looked back since. It's been two years, like full time, like nothing but in the cool bus, school bus. Do you still do and construction work? Yeah. I, 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 every now and again, I try not to work full time because the problem with that is that keeps me locked in one space. I start working for a contractor and they're like, oh, I want to put, I want you to get on this job after this one's over and then it kind of spirals. And then I, I find myself painted into a corner where I might have to burn a bridge to get on down the road that I might need to cross one day. And I try to avoid doing that. So I find opportunities to do like small one shot jobs, like in my last little break this year, cause I, I have a, a off season, if you will. And my cousin, Chrissy, her husband, Steve, he's a subcontractor. And so I'm like, Hey man, while I'm hanging out around you guys, if you've got any little small jobs, I'll jump on that. And so I did the rough in on their new home. That only takes a couple of days for me to completely wire a house. And we had like a remodel job, adding a media room into the basement of this home that some folks have in hot springs. And so I went and I did the electrical work for that. changed up some lighting, did small things that I can go in, have a definitive stop and start in short time frames. And, and that works good for me because those jobs tend to be more on the lucrative side when you're doing like small remodel projects and everything. when, you know, when I'm charging a flat rate and I can turn around and like I said, do things, get in and get out essentially. Go ahead. Do you stay in one area and do a project and then use the money that you earn from that to finance your travel to other areas? Or do you just find something to do wherever you're traveling? A little bit of both. Yeah. It's like, like I said, like in my off season during the winter months, I try to get about as south as I can get and hang out until the spring. Like most of my venues that I register for are start in, in earlier mid March. And then usually I try to be wrapped up by November. So that way I can like have November, December, January, and February just to be somewhere and be comfortable. And what are some of the favorite places you family. visited? Let's see now, like this last November, we went down to Florida. I had some friends in Carabell and in Chattahoochee. So I wanted to visit them because it's nicer in November in Florida than it is other places that aren't Florida. Exactly. <laughs> and yeah, and I, I spent some time with my cousins, Chrissy and Steve, that I mentioned in a town called Amity, which is a real rural spot, pretty much backwoods camping in the Ozarks, south of Hot Springs. And I visit my family, my uncle David, my aunt Brenda, and my cousins, Cindy and Robert, who live in Hot Springs. 
I've got lots of friends in Little Rock, Arkansas. I visit them from time to time. And my cousin here in Missouri, I've got a lot of friends and family up in the Dakotas. My, my mother, my brothers, my sister, all of them, and some really close friends, patients in Alden. They all live in the Grand Forks, North Dakota hub. We've been to Montana. We've been to Wisconsin. After April, we're going to go, we're going to go back to Arkansas for the eclipse. And then I've got one show the last weekend in April in St. Joseph, Missouri. And then we're going to head to North Carolina and I'm going to check out some ancestral homelands on the north banks of the Catawba River in the Steel Creek community of Greater Charlotte. The Price branch of the Catawba River is named after one of my direct ancestors, wow. a gentleman named John Price who he gained that property. It was deeded to him directly from King George II in 1752, back when this was, back when that was the Carolina territory. It was just a colony that we weren't even the United States of America yet. How and I was, yeah. And so I want to go there and check that out. And then there's another spot in North Carolina where another ancestor of mine, a gentleman named Ulrich Frederick Fritz, who fought in the civil, in the revolutionary war. And he, he has an obelisk in his honor in a community that he helped found. And so I want to see that as well on my way up to Pennsylvania. I've got a cryptid fair and expo convention. I don't know what you really want to call it, but I'm going to be having a vendor booth at that and doing runic divination demonstrations and signing copies of my book and offering different divination tools and altar items. That'll be May 25th. And so that's my loose plan. And I figure I'll do stuff in North Carolina along the way. But my main thing is to go check out those places. How cool. So is that what you do is just travel around the country and attending those fairs and those meetings and then yeah. working some odd jobs here and there to really help finance the trip? Yeah, that's pretty much it. You know, what I do each year, I'll pick three or four different states and me and Loki, will, I'll find like different craft and vendor shows or renaissance fairs or different venues that I think would be a good fit for me and go there. Or I'll, one of the things that I consistently do is I, I'm registered through the day labor company. It's called, and they've got a lot of branches all over the country. And that's an easy way for me to come into a more, more populated area and get in and get it, work a job, get some money and then keep on moving but to keep my nest egg built up because I try to always keep a, a cushion or a bubble Smart. instead of, instead of like literally living week to week, I would, I like to have at least a month's worth of finances put back, which he, like I can live fairly comfortably, fairly cheap. Even what I consider a month's worth of finances, I probably double that. So I'll probably keep a, a two month bubble if I want to get realistic, but I don't like making it to where I have to have a sense of desperation or urgency because that's the most important thing is not feeling like you're painted into a corner, like your options are limited, like you're stuck in a place or you have to settle for some doing something that you're not comfortable with or a rate of pay that you're not comfortable with. And cause that's one of the things about why I don't really do a lot of camp hosting jobs because they want you to be locked in a certain place for a certain amount of time. And usually if you're getting any, it's any actual compensation, it's a very small stipend and there's no, you get stuck there cause they give you just enough to survive. And then if you want to like, oh, I'll, I want to go somewhere else here or there. It's really hard for you to have that reserve to finance jumping mm -hmm. here and there, even if it's all you got to do is pay gas to get from point A to point B. What do you, you know? like most about the RVing experience? I like the freedom of it. I like the change of, of the environment. Me and Loki, my cat, I have a really close bond with him and everything. And I get a lot of joy from taking him to new places and giving him experiences. He's lived in 15 states so far. And we take it, I take him to all these different types of state parks and we'll reserve places. Like last year around this time in April, we were at the Maquaquetta Cavern State Park in Iowa, just south of Dubuque. And I took him spelunking and he loved that. Really? And yeah. He thinks it, it was like, we'd go down in the caves 
and he go meow and listen and look at his echo and it was just the coolest thing i got i've got pictures of it on his uh facebook page oh. it's called the adventures of little loki man your, and your dad uh, has a facebook page yeah he's got his own facebook page i've got my personal profile i've got my professional profile to promote my work as an author that i do daily uploads on and then i've got his facebook page that i document our travels that's funny. We'll have to link to that in the show notes for sure. Have you encountered Absolutely. any challenges while you've been out RVing and working on the road? Yeah, it's it, the, the thing about being nomadic and everything, you have to have a high level of situational awareness. You have to recognize that right or wrong, good or bad, there are certain places, there are certain environments, there are certain interactions that are not conductive to what you're trying to do. And you need to realize that it doesn't matter if you're right or not. Sometimes drawing a hard line in the sand is the worst thing you can do. Don't seek conflict. Don't try to argue about, I am I should be here. I'm allowed to be here, Rod. Because the thing is, when you're a, a traveler, when you're a drifter, when you're a nomad, when you're a whatever you want to consider yourself, the local police are not your friends. They are going to side with the local people eight days a week. And it doesn't matter if you're right or wrong, more often than not, they want you down the road mm -hmm. and they're not going to deal with you amicably. Okay. So my advice is always avoid conflict. Don't go places. If you get a bad feeling, go with that. Don't be in, don't find yourself looking for work in a place that you're like, I don't know about this. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and mark that off the list. Head on down the road, find some place you are comfortable, some place you do feel safe. Me, I grew up in an urban environment a lot. I can navigate those types of environments. Not everyone can successfully. And so my advice is if you feel you're out of your element, you probably are, and you should respect your intuition and don't put yourself in a position where you find yourself having to fix another situation that when you're nomadic, that's the thing is we live in our houses and our houses are our transportation. If we find ourselves like parking somewhere, oh, it'll be fine. And we come back and we've got a boot on our rig because you told yourself, oh, they should be able to tell. I ain't trying to stay here. It should be fine. Don't ever convince yourself it should be fine. Mm -hmm. That is my biggest advice to travelers and nomad people. Tread lightly. Good idea. <laughs> what kind of perks have you got to enjoy while you've been out enjoying your nomadic lifestyle? I've got to, I've gotten to meet all kinds of really cool people, you know, from all different kinds of walks of life. Cause I do volunteer work. Like, um, last February when I was in the little rock area, I was, um, uh, going and I was doing pickups and deliveries for a local food pantry that had two community refrigerators. And so I got to interact with both the people who were working volunteer set up, coordinating, getting the food and dispersing it interacting with the people who were hosting these locations, interacting sometimes with the people that were coming and getting help. Uh, I'll do volunteer works at animal shelters. That's how I met Loki in the first place is I was doing volunteer work on Saturdays at a place called Circle of Friends Animal Shelter in the Grand Forks, North Dakota community. And I walked in one Saturday and boom, that was it. Me and him, we've been thick as thieves since day one. That's cute. And yeah, so I get to meet all these different people everywhere I go. I just, I try to make myself a value. And I say, whether I'm doing construction work, like I said before, like with higher quests, going and getting construction cleanup jobs where they just need a guy to pick up debris on a job site. And because I've got a construction background, I know the difference between random materials and straight up trash. And so it's really easy for me to get construction cleanup calls. And then I get to network with contractors, with superintendents and know where other work is or where other work is it. I'll be like, because these superintendents, they travel around from job to job like I do, but on a different schedule. Mm -hmm. And so I can turn around and be like, Hey, look, I'm planning on being in, in North Carolina the month of May. Oh yeah. Allied construction. They've got something going on in Winston Salem. I know the superintendent on that project. I can shoot him a message and have you a little spot waiting there. But like I said, and, and all it takes is just interacting with people. And like I said, at, being proactive in your network. And that's something that I would do. If maybe other people, that wouldn't be a good fit for them. Maybe they have to network 
in different circles in different ways. But that's just a real world example of something that I've done that does work for me. Because like I said, do it within the higher quest network, they kind of these managers, they'll pass it along whenever I'm in an area. Last August, when I was doing a show in Frisco, Texas, they have a higher quest branch in Garland. And so I swooped in, I got a job working for two weeks while I was in that area. And I didn't have to go out filling out a bunch of applications. I didn't have to be doing a bunch of cold calls. I didn't have to waste a lot of time, energy, and resources trying to find something for me to fall right into. I just made use of an established network and just figured out where are my skills a good fit? That's excellent. Who can advice. readily apply my skill set? Very good. That's smart to do that kind of networking. Do you yeah. stay in campgrounds when you're traveling or do you boondock? I've done a little bit of both. I honestly, I prefer to stay in campgrounds as much as possible because again, with, with me and Loki, I like taking him places where he can walk around, where he can explore, where he can see and do things. And I get joy from that. And like the nature of what I do going around and doing these shows, I come in and usually it's a day or two on a weekend. I just did SpiritCon Independence on March 2nd and 3rd at the Independence Masonic Lodge. And while I, that, I had to work that Saturday and Sunday, but then after that, like I break down, I put all my stuff away Saturday, Sunday night, and then me and Loki loaded up and we headed out. I spent a couple of days with my cousin before I got out of town. And I went down to Sparrowfoot Campground and I reserved a campground for a whole week. And the thing is, be mindful about off-season pricing. Mm -hmm. And I highly recommend getting an America the Beautiful Pass because the campground I stayed at, the, the off-season rates were $10 a day. And because I had an, an America the Beautiful Pass, it cost me $80 for an annual fee. It took half off of that. So it was only $5 a day to reserve a campsite. So I had a campsite with electric for a whole week for $35. That's amazing. Yeah, good. Yeah. Those are the, one of the best deals in the federal government is those type yeah. of passes. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, when, and like I'll, I usually use um, the website recreation.gov to find most of the campsites that I prefer to go to. Okay. You know, because you can just type in, they've got an app, but my phone's so loaded down, I just don't have the space for it. So I just go on their website and I type in, for example, Kansas City, Missouri. And it's going to tell me all the campsites in, in extending proximity from whatever address or zip code or city that I typed in. And I can find the campground that has the features, the amenities, and the price that fits for my needs. It lists, you know? the, if I'm not mistaken, it lists the national parks, the Forest yep. Service campgrounds, as well as the Army Corps of Engineer campgrounds, things like that. Anywhere that people, public camping is allowed, you probably find on that site. And here's the thing, though, that I found out the hard way, though, about recreation.gov is there are a lot of state parks and state campgrounds that aren't listed that for, for whatever reason. And I can go and search in Missouri, and there are Missouri state parks that I can't reserve through recreation.gov. So be my, I just want people to be mindful about that, that there are times where you look things up on recreation.gov, but then go and do a secondary search for whatever state you're in, do state parks, because a lot of states, like Iowa is the same way. You, they've got state parks that aren't listed on recreation.gov. I know Missouri has state parks that aren't listed on recreation.gov. So it's always good to do that backup check and find those state parks that aren't linked to the national and federal system. If you had to start over your RVing experience or work camping, is there anything you'd do differently? I honestly, I, can, I, I don't think so. Everything has been like really just fortuitous for me. Of course, I had, like I said, like growing up as a kid, travel around a lot. I'm a minimalist. So I didn't have to, um, learn to pare things down. I guess the only thing maybe is I would be more mindful on the upfront about the nature of storage within all this, keeping it functional. Cause that was a learning curve. Like I had to add a second dresser in on my stuff mm -hmm. and 
just to account for being able to get things in and out of drawers. Okay. That, you know, cause I use a lot of totes for keeping stuff in cause they're stackable and they yes. don't flip fill the way that a lot of other stuff does, easily. you know? And, yeah. 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 You got to, you got to go through a next level ding for, <laughs> for a really <laughs> we all wild try to turn. Avoid yes. those. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. That's my other thing too, is I definitely look and drive like a grandpa. I always keep it like five miles under the speed limit more often than not. But of course, a big part of that is so with my spiritual practice as a Germanic heathen, I've got an altar set up that I built myself and I leave it out. When I'm driving, I don't put it away and take it out, put it away and take it out. That takes a lot of time and energy and effort. I actually tried that the first few months and it was exhausting and I just couldn't do it. And so I drive to where all of my stuff can stay set up and stay out at all times. Okay. And that's good. Do you have any advice for people who are just considering the RV lifestyle or doing this kind of thing? Yeah, think really long and hard about what's important to you because it is a whole lifestyle. Like if you think that, oh, I'm just going to live like my apartment, but my apartment moves. No, it is a whole different living dynamic. And like I was talking earlier about being really proactive, avoiding conflict and confrontations. People who live in, in a specific set stationary location but you can establish territory and lay claim to your space. This is my space. But the thing about being nomadic is you're always like borrowing or coming into some established space. And so you have to have a certain attitude that comes with living that way mm -hmm. that facilitates you not having conflict that you even have to avoid. Okay, And so that's the biggest thing is you've got to look at, I am going back again to the spiritual thing, because that's a big part of what I do. You got to do some shadow work. You got to look inside at the parts of yourself that make you uncomfortable sometimes and be like, can I live this way? Am I going to be comfortable living this way? Or is me making this choice because I'm frustrated with my life circumstances going to lead me to doing things and being the type of person that I really don't want to be because there is a level of isolation. There's a level of impermanence. There's a lot of things like I said that people who live in one place, even for six, nine months out of the year or who have a home base that they go back to, there's a certain attitude and a certain like perspective and a whole like lifestyle dynamic that is intrinsic to that. That again, when you're living nomadic, is really antithetical to that. And so if you're just, like I said, if you're just mad with some aspect of your life and you think that just taking off and just living nomadically is going to fix your life, that's usually going to exacerbate a problem because what you're going to do is you're going to separate yourself from an established support network that you've already got that right. for whatever reason you're choosing not to access. When you only run away from your problems, you wind up bringing them with you. Many times right. than, than not. Yeah. And that's all thing. Yeah. Where, no matter where you're at, there you are. And okay. that's the thing is like me, I'm happy being immersed in nature. I'm happy walking in forested trails and like hearing waterfalls and walking through caves and floating a river with my cat. That was something we did last summer as I took and I made him a little styrofoam float and everything. I took sheets of um, foam insulation and duct taped them together, made him a big raft. Cause I knew that he couldn't float on anything inflatable, but yeah, I made him a little, made him like a little, like little pontoon raft so he could get out and float a river with me and everything. And like, I kind of joke around the next thing I got to do is take him skydiving, but I'm impressed that you could get a cat anywhere near water. So how, you know, can, well, go ahead. how can people connect with you if they'd like to get in touch with you? You know, my, my author page on Facebook is probably the most consistent, best way to do that. And I definitely would appreciate the follows and the likes and the shares and all of that comes with it. But if you're on Facebook, you type in at Spears.Steven. It's S-P-E-E-R-S-S-T-E-V-E-N. And my I do have a website. It's StevenSpears.com, all lowercase, all put together. You can order copies of my book through either one. But again, like I said, I 
I upload daily new content on my author page on Facebook. And so that's the one that consistently gets the most traffic. I, I joke around, I say that it's like doing a do devotional Bible verse, but for heathens. For, <laughs> thank you very much for sharing your story with me today. I really appreciate it. It sounds like you've had quite the adventure and it's fun that your cat gets to enjoy it too. Oh yeah. Yeah. I was hoping he wasn't going to be taking a nap. Usually whenever I'm doing this, he's up in my lap trying to figure out who I'm talking to. <laughs> but like I said, we've had, we've had quite an adventure at the Sparrowfoot campgrounds. We did lots of exploring and so he's recuperating for our next round. After we leave out here, we're going to go to Lake of the Ozarks State Park and um, stay there for at least five days. That's wonderful. Thank you again, Stephen. I really appreciate your time today. and wish you the best yep, of luck in the future. Thank you. You have a blessed day. I thank Stephen Spears for taking time to talk to us about his RVing experiences as well as his research and writing projects. He tries to spend the winter months getting as far south as he can. Last November, he spent time in the Florida Panhandle. He has friends and family scattered all over America. So as Stephen and Lukey like to visit them frequently as he participates in fairs and expos to do runic divination demonstrations and book signings. To keep things fresh, Stephen picks three or four different states each year, then looks for fairs and festivals in them. He sets up a schedule to visit as many venues as he can. When funds run low and he can't find a construction project to work on, Stephen connects with day labor companies to find short-term jobs. That prevents him from having to dip into his savings for monthly expenses. He likes to set aside a month's worth of expenses so he's never truly in a desperate situation and he always have the option of moving to find something else to explore. The primary reason why Stephen renovated his schoolie was to enjoy more freedom. He and Loki have been to 15 states so far and plan to add several others this year. Stephen relies on the recreation.gov website to find inexpensive places to stay when he's traveling. He encourages people to get out and travel rather than confine themselves to the same apartment year after year. During his free time, Stephen enjoys walking along forest trails looking for waterfalls or exploring caves. He even made a floating device for his cat to join him when Stephen is out exploring. To connect with him, visit www.stephenspears.com or look for his author page on Facebook. Today's episode is sponsored by Work Camper News. If you have more questions and answers when it comes to the work camping and RVing lifestyle, then don't worry, Work Camper News has your back. Attend a free monthly work camping Q&A webinar to get your questions answered. Each month, the knowledgeable team behind WorkCamper.com hosts a free live webinar where they answer questions submitted by folks just like you who are learning about the RV lifestyle, just getting started, or who've been work camping for a while. They cover topics like what kind of work camping jobs are available, what do those jobs pay, tips for writing a work camper resume, questions to ask an employer, what type of RV is best, how to get your mail as an RVer, and much more. In the description of each video, you'll find a list of questions or answered so you can quickly jump to the sections you want to hear. Register for the next live webinar at workcamper.com forward slash answers. Or get detailed answers now by watching the recordings of past Q&A webinars on the Work Camper News YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash workcamper and click on the Q&A on Work Camping playlist. That's all for this week's show. Next time, I'll be speaking with a pair of rangers who work for a U.S. Army Corps of Engineers project near Branson, Missouri. They're looking for volunteers to spend 90 days serving visitors or working as campground hosts. I'll have that interview on the next episode of The Work Camper Show. Thanks for listening.